I come to today's capstone program for the code five clinical improvement. Clinical quality improvement program. Um, I'm, I'd like to welcome you all to this capstone event. My name is Mofola Shade Onolapo. Most people call me Shade, the smooth operator, you know, and I'm one of the four faculty members for this cohort um, CK program. Today's our capstone event and it's usually a day of joy and celebration and to the participant, I'm sure it's a day of great relief that they don't, they won't keep getting emails from Jen and Lisa about webinars and stuff. But more importantly, it's a day to celebrate all the months of hard work that you've put in and also to share with the, our delegated guests and honored invitees today all the work you've done over the past few months. It's a celebratory event. Oh, unfortunately, we would have loved to do this in person to give you your, you know, graduation gowns and caps and take some lovely photographs. But we're where we are today because of COVID. Hopefully, in the future, things will get back to, to the norm as we know it. And as I mentioned earlier, it's a day of joy, it's a day of celebration, and also it's intended to be a culminating moment. It's not the stop gap in your CKIP journey, it's uh, another stepping stone in your clinical improvement journey. Before I proceed any further, I would like to acknowledge that I'm joining you today from my corner office in, a, in our house, um, which is situated in Regina, in the Territory 4, the homeland of the Métis. I pay my respect to the treaties that were made on this land, and I, I acknowledge the arms and the mistakes that were made in the past. And on an individual level, I'm committed to move forward in partnership with the Indigenous spirit in this indigenous nation in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration and do my part in ensuring that there's equity and fairness in all that I do, both in my personal life and also my professional life. Having said that, I'd like to welcome all our invitees and dignitaries have joined us this morning. Um, we all know that this program will not, will not be a success if not for the partners that have put together the you know brainstorm ideas and ensure that this program keeps rolling off. We're in the cohort five now, five years. It's hard for me to believe that it, just a few years ago I was in the same position as you all presenting at my own capstone event. And over the years we've continued to receive funding from the ministry, from SMA, from SHA, and to which we're deeply grateful to all of them. And some of them are represented here today. And more importantly, our biggest partners are the patients that we serve. And we have a partner, a patient partner representative here with us also this morning. So I'm very thankful for all of them for being here. If you want to participate with the program, every invitee should have received an abstract, uh, um, CQ abstract booklet so that highlights all the project that the individual participants have done. And you can follow on along with us as we go on this morning. If you need to have any questions sent to the HQC host, just use a chat button and kindly ensure that you send directly to the host. We want to minimize any distractions because the, the quick talk is only three minutes and we want to make sure that every invited guest is able to pay attention to the project that each individual has done over the past few years. I mean, you've done a lot of work and we are asking you to compress it into a three minutes talk. We don't want to lose the audience. We just want people to appreciate all the effort that has gone into all the work that you've done. Jen, Lisa, Chelsea, where they're in the background, they are the techies for us today. So any questions, just pop in the chat and send to them directly. And just so you know, put on your best smiles, you know, if you need to quickly adjust your makeup and lipstick and you know you are being recorded and you would not you can't be sure where this recording is going to go i remember when we had us i think we were sent the link of our recordings through youtube and out of my excited state i sent it to my dad who was happy to share it with the entire community back home so you never know where the videos can go so put on your best mouth and uh, this is just to let you know that this program is being recorded today right so we want to go on to acknowledge the people that we've invited to be with us here this morning and as i mentioned earlier our biggest partners in what we do both 
for all of us in healthcare, whether we're directly involved in clinical work or indirectly involved in clinical, whatever capacity that we do, the, our biggest partners are the patients. Without them, we literally can do nothing. And on that note, I'd like to invite Sue Nimigis. She's our our partner indeed in every sense of the word. She's been with the program for a number of years. She's a patient partner from Radio Saskatchewan. She's been a member of the CQ Participant Selection Committee. She has served in various QI initiatives within the SHA, both on the local level, and she's not a stranger to QI and change management. She has brought in, having been part of this selection committee over the years, she's brought in unique perspectives on behalf of the patient and the relatives. And as we all know, the patient's perspectives are really, really important in what we do on a daily basis. So I'm very happy and I'm very honored to have Sue join us this morning. I would like to invite her just to give us a few remarks and to kick off this capstone program. Over to you, Sin. Thank you for joining us once again. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, and thank you so much for having me here again for this CQIP Cohort 5 Capstone event. Um, I, as she mentioned, my name is Sue Nimigers. I have been a patient family partner since um, about 2016. And I too am, am on Treaty 4 down here in the southeast corner of the province. And I live in Radville, southwest of Weyburn. So this is my fourth time participating in one of these cohorts as a patient family partner. Each year, I have to say, it has just gotten better and better. So when I see my name first on the agenda this morning, the first thing I thought was good, I get to set the table. So we are here, we are about to hear from 12 individuals that have cooked up something spectacular. Something, some of these things may need some tweaking. Some things might be shared amongst yourselves, like sharing a recipe, and some things will change or will continue to improve over time. So we're about to sit at a table where there are these cooks, these quality improvement leaders. They will share their recipes, their learnings, and maybe even their failures. So let me set the table so you can get comfortable and enjoy and be wowed by these 12 fabulous chefs. Dr. Kevin Wasco was a graduate of cohort two. I think it was cohort two. Um, in that graduation capstone, he said, I gained more from the learnings than from the project. He said his takeaway from that experience was how he learned to improve and he learned from the process of improving. And another quote I found from cohort two as well was a pharmacist named Sarah Linz. She graduated from this program and she made this comment, complete all your tasks with the patient in mind. She said, don't just try to cut out time for quality improvement, incorporate quality improvement into every action, into everything you're doing. So it gives me great pleasure to be here again today and to set the table for you to witness once again, the magic that happens when improvement is embedded into our daily actions. And thanks again for listening to the side of the patient and their families and bon appetit. And Tracy, I think you're up next. Thank you very much, Sue. Um, thank you very for your kind words. And I didn't realize the doctors are now chefs. So yeah, I can't wait to eat what you are cooking. Uh, it gives me great joy once again this morning to invite the CEO of Health Quality Council, Saskatchewan. Um, Tracy is no stranger to some of us. She is literally the powerhouse behind HQC that makes everything run as smoothly as you see. And um, even though she looks very benign, I bet she's a really tough lady <laughs> behind the desk. <laughs> it takes a strong person to run such a very finely run organization. So thank you very much for all you do. And as many people know, HQC is one of the partners for the CQ program that made it happen. And they've played a very key role in ensuring that the program continues to run excellently. When, whenever we go to the HQC office in person, when we used to meet in person, that seems like a long time ago, you know, we're very nicely welcomed and they give us nice meal, you know, it just always feels like going home. So it gives me great joy and great pleasure to invite Tracy to give us a few remarks today. 
Welcome, Tracy. Thank you for joining us. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for having me and thank you so much for that very kind introduction. That, that means a lot coming from you. Um, I'm joining you today from Health Quality Council's offices in Saskatoon on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. And I am so thrilled to be here today to celebrate your achievements in graduating from the Clinical Quality Improvement Program Cohort 5. So as an organization de dedicated to accelerating improvement in health and health care in Saskatchewan, the Health Quality Council is thrilled to see that today we are adding 12 clinicians, including practicing physicians and pharmacists, to our community of clinical quality improvement program graduates. At, would you believe it, a community that is now 91 strong and growing. Uh, we're almost at 100, so that is just so great to see. Uh, continuing to build and grow this community of clinicians that are equipped to lead and facilitate quality improvement across Saskatchewan is vitally important to all of us in this province. A program like this is the effort of many people and organizations, and I'd just like to take a minute to acknowledge those who have made this cohort, cohort five, happen. So we are so grateful to the cohort five faculty and coaches, who many of whom I'm seeing on this call, it's just so great to see, as well as our program and project sponsors for their continued support and leadership in our learning community. And we hope to see you again in future cohorts. As you know, uh, developing the Clinical Quality Improvement Program is a team effort, and I'm happy to see many of our partners on this list speaking after me today. Um, we couldn't do this without them, and so our patient partners, and so welcome, Sue, so nice to see you here today, uh, the Saskatchewan Medical Association, the Ministry of Health, and the Saskatchewan Health Authority. So thank you to all of you for your support of the program. And I'd be remiss if I didn't recognize our small but mighty HQC team and their efforts at providing a high quality learning experience while demonstrating their commitment to continuous improvement as well and delivering the very first totally virtual cohort of the program this year, which required lots of uh, changes and, and amendments and, and things. So um, just really want to thank the team for all of their work. Um, our health system, uh, no doubt we're all aware, has had a difficult couple of years. Uh, and more challenges likely lie ahead. Despite all of that, we have come together to make significant accomplishments in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic and trying to resume the services uh, that we, we all depend on. In all of this, one of the things I have observed is that the improvement skills and tools that you have learned in the Clinical Quality Improvement Program have played a significant role in planning and implementing responses to the pandemic, as well as resuming those critical services. I've also seen many of our CQIP community leading those efforts, which is just so heartwarming. While we still face challenges, what reassures me is that we have this community of clinicians, uh, strong and growing, that are dedicated to continuous quality improvement who are using their skills to make a difference. And now all of you are a part of that community. I would also encourage all of you to continue to contribute to this learning community, and in particular by joining future cohorts as a faculty member or a coach. Cohort 6 is scheduled to start in early 2023, so you'll have an opportunity coming up right away to do that. And I think as many on this, uh, on this meeting will attest, uh, you will likely learn just as much, if not more, than you did the first time around. I sincerely hope that each one of you will find ongoing opportunities to apply your quality improvement expertise in the communities where you live and work. I also encourage you to engage your circle of colleagues and coworkers and friends in quality improvement activities in your communities. So uh, just to close, uh, optimizing the health of all people in Saskatchewan and optimizing the quality of the health services, health and care services that we provide are extremely worthy goals. And I want to thank each of you for making a commitment to those goals. And I wish you much success in your ongoing journey towards achieving them. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Tracy. Thank you for your lot of kind words. Our next guest is um, Mr. Mark Caesar. He's the Director of Economics with the Saskatchewan Medical Association, SMA for short, as we all know it. Mark has been the Director of Economics at SMA since 2014. He was very instrumental in negotiating with the Ministry to secure funding for the very first pilot program of the secret program. And uh, they, he's been also involved in ongoing negotiations with the government to ensure that we have funding to ensure that physicians can take time out of their busy schedules and participate in this program. So if there's one person you all want to be very thankful for, he's certainly one of them. So 
Thank you, Mark, for joining us this morning. It's a pleasure to have you with us, and I'd like you to give us a few remarks from your end. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Shade, for the introduction and uh, doing the, the land acknowledgements on behalf of everyone. And I'm, I'm in Saskatoon as well, and so Treaty 6 and homeland of the Métis. And um, so I guess re regarding negotiations, maybe I'll just quickly tell a little story. <clears throat> and really, um, Bonnie Brossart um, should get a lot of credit for the, the negotiating part of, the, of this program. And um, you know, it was back in 2015, both Bonnie and I, very, very new at the SMA, we kind of got thrown into the negotiations process, new for both of us. And, you know, we're, we're in this room together with ministry folks and, uh, you know, it's the atmosphere is kind of stuffy, kind of guarded. Everyone's holding their cards close, talking about money, fees, all these sorts of things. And uh, Bonnie kind of pitches this idea across the table to Max Hendricks. And this was kind of like, you know, Max, you remember when we went down to Utah, we looked at, uh, we learned about um, Intermountain Healthcare and we learned about the mini uh, advanced training program that they have. You know, we've, some of our own Saskatchewan physicians have been through that program. What if we created our own made in Saskatchewan version of, of uh, this mini ATP? And um, it, it was a really lovely exchange because it, it changed the mood around the table and uh, you know, people let their guard down a little bit. Um, people leaned in a little bit. There's good discussion. We also had uh, Dr. Sridhar at the table as, as our co-chair, who had been a part of the the program uh, in Utah, and it, it was it was just a really kind of a a nice magical moment at at the negotiations table. Just a real change of pace. And um, uh, so, you know, fast forward a few months when we finished negotiations, we were able to set aside just a little over one million dollars as as um, seed funding to get this program started. And so, you know, it took it took leadership, it took insights, you know, Bonnie and Max really supportive right at the start. Um, and then HQC and the, the folks at the ministry, the appropriateness of care uh, team really jumped in and it, there's a ton of work up front to to get this uh, this program started. And uh, so, it, you know, it took it took a village to to really build this program. And um, so I just want to really express you know, gratitude on behalf of the SMA for the ongoing support, um, the ongoing funding. So because of the success of the first two, three rounds of, 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 of this program, we've secured ongoing annualized funding. So we've moved away from this lump sum of funding. So now we, we have some secured funding and uh, the program continues to grow and we have some room for that growth. But, uh, you know, I think the, the, the analogy I think of uh, with this program and, and QI and the, the growing cohort as as Tracy mentioned earlier is you know um, single single drops of water can become a mighty ocean and I think that's uh I see that happening uh, slowly but surely with this with this type of work and uh, you know I'm really excited for the future uh, looking at the cohorts I see more and more allied healthcare professionals becoming involved in the program so you know, this idea of team-based care the patient family perspective um, being included in these projects. I'm really excited about this growing talent pool of, of leaders and QI experts and, you know, how do we continue to, to nourish this group and uh, leverage their talents. And uh, so anyways, just a real heartfelt thank you from on behalf of the SMA and I, I look forward to, to seeing the presentations today. So thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. That was really nice. That's a lot, such a lovely story. And while we were speaking, and a thought just occurred to me, just like Sue mentioned earlier on, I said, we're waiting for the chefs to present their recipes or what they've done. And it, it just struck me that, okay, they are the chefs, but you actually, you all, all of you representatives from HQC, SMA, the ministry and SHA, you kind of like the people that were sent into the world to get ingredients and made everything, brought it in-house and then handed it over to the chefs to cook. So thank you for purchasing really good ingredients for us. And then we are standing on your shoulders today because I've also been a participant of this clinical improvement program and I'm deeply grateful for all of your hard work. We also have with us this morning a representative from the Ministry of Health and um, we have Ms. Denise Maxa with us, who is Associate Deputy Minister from the Saskatchewan Ministry of Health. 
Um, as everybody has been saying so far this morning, want to acknowledge your contribution for making this program a continued journey and for making it something that physicians look forward to to participating in. There are not many programs on the province that there's a wait list for physicians to participate, but this is certainly one of them. It's gained a lot of traction amongst physicians, and that's due to the fact that we continue to have the support of the government and the support of all the stakeholders involved. So it's my pleasure this morning to invite Ms. Maxa to join us and give us a few remarks. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to present uh, opening remarks today on behalf of the ministry uh, to this graduate of cohorts. Um, ensuring patients uh, receive the right care and provide the right providers, provided by the right providers in the right place at the right time is an important priority for uh, the ministry and our health system. Improvements in an innovation such as those championed by the clinical quality improvement program are key in ensuring appropriate care is provided. Only through our partnerships with the Health Quality Council, the SMA, the Saskatchewan Health Authority, are we best positioned to provide services. This group of uh, clinicians, as some have said, are joining a growing number of clinical quality improvement uh, program graduates across Saskatchewan. I would like to acknowledge uh, that this is a diverse group of graduates um, comprised of physicians, medical residents, nurse practitioners, pharmacists, and pediatricians. Your hard work over the course of the past several months to complete projects and assignments uh, for the program is greatly valued, especially with uh, COVID placing continued challenges on our health care. And through that, your ongoing daily work. Um, I appreciate that partnerships will continue to lead quality improvement within the healthcare system after the completion of this program. I look forward to seeing uh, what you can achieve through your out your career and, and as important leaders in your fields of work. So thank you and congratulations. Thank you very much. And last but not the least, I would like to invite Dr. Rashad Hansia. He's a physician executive lead for Integrated Urban Health for the Saskatchewan Health Authority. As we all know, one of the ultimate goals of SHA is to create physicians' um, capacity, physician capacity within the QI world and to ensure that we have physicians at all levels to be able to lead QI projects and be local consultant or consultant wherever they may find themselves in all matters regarding quality improvement programs. And it's no surprise, just as it was mentioned earlier this morning, some of the physician executive or physician leaders that we've had in the province, some of them have passed through this sort of program. Dr. Fori, who is one of our faculty members, has had a QI journey and QI knowledge and experience as well. Kevin Wasco was in my cohort as well. And so we have several people who are current leaders who've passed through this journey. I'm not trying to scare the current participant, but you may find yourself being tapped on the shoulder to become a physician leader in some capacity. I find that this, having this experience and knowledge comes in really handy in your journey. So on behalf of the SHA, I would like to invite Dr. Ansia to give us some of his remarks. Thank you very much, Sade, and good morning, everyone. It's really my pleasure to be joining you today from Regina, which is, of course, on Treaty 4 territory in the homeland of the Métis, uh, on the fifth year of the running of this program already. Um, it's also my privilege to express thanks on behalf of the SHA's executive leadership team to all of the participants here today, to the coaches, to the faculty, to people of the HQC, the SMA, and, of course, the Ministry of Health for making this project um, successful and ongoing and sustainable. It's a really great example in my mind of collaboration and partnership within the system uh, to help improve the healthcare system and ultimately improve patient care for the people of the province that all of us collectively serve. So, you know, such collaboration for me is, is of course embedded in the DNA of the SHA as one of our core values, uh, along with safety, accountability, respect and compassion. And so that collaboration really fits in as does this program with all of those values uh, within the SHA. Continuous improvement, which I know everyone in this group is a champion of, is increasingly, as you all know, being recognized as a core competency for healthcare professionals, including physicians. 
and others, and it's, it's really also uh, part of the leadership skill set that, that is required and more and more so as time progresses to be able to help improve uh, systems and help with uh, system advancement, evolution, and uh, efficiency improvements. So this CEQIP program really helps to stimulate, to foster, and to develop leaders in these fields and is really important for many other reasons, but not least of which include those. As mentioned by others, what's even more remarkable for this particular cohort is that this group has stepped up every one of you have during a pandemic, which is, which is really amazing. So thank you for doing that. Um, it's so important uh, that this work continues and really within the SHA across many areas, the relevance, the impact and the importance of this work is felt. Um, including in the development and evolution of health networks, which is the service delivery model within the SHA. And so training physicians, training other healthcare providers, training these interdisciplinary teams in quality improvement uh, is really significant to contributing to the strategic goals of the SHA and to the improvement of the health system. So it really does foster this continuous growth in this bigger picture of continuous improvement that we all need to and are committed to. So I hope the participants don't see this as the end. I know you won't, but really it is the beginning of your journeys uh, for many and is a stepping stone for some and will help bolster and feed that curiosity and that need and willingness and desire to continue the improvement going forward because there is so much value to the healthcare system that is that is brought about by programs like, such as this. So with that, I'll just um, conclude by congratulating everyone again on your accomplishments and really look forward to, to hearing more about this. I, I just, I was so impressed reading through the abstracts and, and looking at uh, all of the exciting work being done just at the value clinically at that point of care and across the system of the benefits. So thank you very much and congratulations to everyone. Thank you very much. Now, this is the moment we've all been waiting for. So you can just, to all the participants, just shake up the nerves and just stay relaxed. Like it was said earlier on, it's not the end. It's just an opportunity once again to share with those who haven't been with you from the beginning, all the work that has been done. I know we've practiced elevator pitches we've almost sort of bored the life out of you by just practicing and practicing but this is the opportunity to just hone in on that and just show us show everybody that's that is here today all the work that you've put in in the last 10 months or so so we'll be moving on to the quick talk presentations and just a few remarks regarding the quick talk we're really going to be very strict on time it's called quick talk for a reason quick three minutes. And when you're trying to go over the time limit, there'll be an arrow towards my left, the left side of my screen. So I don't know how that present on your screen. Jen, Lisa, can you just show an example of what the annotation would look like just to prompt them when they're trying to go over time? Yeah, on the left corner, that yellow arrow, just to remind you that it's time to round off so that you don't cut into other people's time. The quick talk presentation will be an opportunity to give a project overview for each participant and also for them to reflect on the learnings that they've acquired over the last few months in the course of the program. I will introduce the first speaker and afterwards the, the baton will pass on from the next speaker to the next speaker and then each individual can ask, can, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Can, manage their slides as they would, as they like to. And for the our invited guests this morning, as mentioned earlier, the agenda and the abstract for each of the presenter and the project is in the in booklet that was sent with the invite that you received initially. So our first speaker today would be Kayla. And Kayla is a pediatric nephrologist from Jim Patterson Hospital, Children's Hospital in Saskatoon. And she's worked very hard. Every one of our participants has been working very hard over the last few months, given all the challenges that we've had with COVID pandemic and all of that. So I will not take too much of your time. I'll hand over to Kayla to present to us everything she's been working on for the last few months. Kayla, over to you. Thanks, Shade. 
Uh, so my name is Keila Fled, and my project is on increasing pneumococcal vaccination among children with nephrotic syndrome. Oh, sorry. Uh, so we found that um, nephrotic syndrome has an increased risk of invasive pneumococcal disease. Guidelines recommend children receive pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine at the time of diagnosis. Despite this, most children uh, with nephrotic syndrome followed at the JPCH uh, have not received their pneumococcal vaccination. We did a retrospective study of previous patients that had been followed here, and only 37.5% of the patients received pneumococcal 23 vaccine, and the time to first dose was 1.8 years from the initial diagnosis. We utilized a fishbone diagram to uh, investigate our root cause analysis and discover why the problem existed within our uh, context. I then used um, a driver's diagram to identify change ideas that would be able to combat our problem um, and used a stakeholder analysis to create a team uh, to help uh, achieve our goals. So we did do a retrospective data of since 2007 and the mean time from diagnosis to the first pneumococcal vaccine was 274 weeks. And while when you look at the run chart, it looks like there's an overall trend in more recent years, this is still far, far below our target. With that information in mind, we created a primary aim for pediatric patients with a new diagnosis of nephrotic syndrome to achieve an 80% vaccination rate by their 12 to 14 week visit. And furthermore, with those with an existing diagnosis of nephrotic syndrome, we wanted them to achieve a 60% vaccination rate. So uh, we created a pre-printed clinical order set for the admissions of new and existing nephrotic syndrome patients within the pediatric inpatient department, which included uh, pneumococcal vaccination orders, as well as a QR code for further information about pneumococcal vaccinations. In addition, we uh, did a pediatric outpatient department standardized order set um, uh, for identification and administration of the vaccination in their outpatient clinic visits. Um, unfortunately, because of barriers during the pandemic, we have only just implemented this new intervention. And thus, only the plan and do stages of the first PDSA uh, have been completed. But within time, we hope to do the studying and acting part until we achieve our goal. So, in terms of key learnings, this was a fantastic program that I was honored to be a part of. Um, there's lots that I learned during this course, but my main takeaways are to not start with a solution, that planning is the most important stage, and that change is slow, and so not to get discouraged when things aren't going as uh, predicted, and that improvement takes flexibility and teamwork, and that's everything. Thanks very much. All right, are they just gonna flip to me? So I'm not gonna start until I see my slides. I'm gonna assume that will be my introduction to get going. Can you advance the slide? Uh, nope. I don't know how to pass the presenter ball, so <laughs> that's something I was supposed to do. <laughs> Lee, and Sarah, you have the presenter ball now. Oh, Jane has got it. There, okay, perfect. I'll be quiet. Okay, so my name is Sarah Liskwich, and I work at the uh, as a hospice physician on an accountable care unit at the Pasqua Hospital in Regina. And for my CQIP um, project, I looked at improving communication between the inpatient pharmacy team. So we know transitioning patients from the community into the hospital and back home is a dynamic and multifaceted process where the healthcare systems, hospitals, providers, patients, and their families all share responsibility. Patients' transitions from one setting to another is a very vulnerable time, and it's when safety lapses can result in negative clinical outcomes and adverse events, such as diversion of controlled substances in the community. There are seven key elements essential for safe and seamless transitions, including medication management, 
transition planning, patient family engagement and education, communication and transferring information, follow-up care, healthcare provider engagement, and shared accountability across organizations. Currently, outpatient pharmacies are not routinely notified when patients are admitted to hospital, which I identified as a use of controlled substances can occur. So my aim statement was that by December of 2023, all patients admitted to Unit 4A at Pasco Hospital will have their outpatient pharmacy notified of their admission. By developing and implementing an outpatient pharmacy notification tool on admission to an accountable care unit ward, we endeavored to incorporate several of the key elements of safe transitions and care and explore whether resulted in fewer medication errors and the minimization of inappropriate dispensing of controlled substances in the community through an earlier targeted communication with the outpatient team. Major themes that led to medication errors and opportunities for diversion of prescription controlled transitions of care include poor communication between facilities, lack of recognition of the problem for providers and patients, inconsistent processes for medication reconciliation and outpatient notification, as well as a lack of standardized expectations for providers. And you can see I'm older than Kayla because I've got my written instead of nicely typed there on the, on the picture. Um, after many iterations, here is my most recent diagram ideas, but in the interest of a three minute presentation, I'm going to highlight two of the primary drivers uh, that, that were awareness and communication. Our patient family advisor input highlighted that patients are unaware that there is communication between the hospital and the regular outpatient pharmacy uh, when they're little. And many physicians and pharmacists admitted that they didn't consider the possibility of controlled substances being diverted and filled in the community while patients were admitted to hospital. So the hospital and outpatient pharmacies use separate information systems to track patients, dispense, and they're accessible to each other in the two different settings. So we needed an appropriate means of communication between the two settings um, when we were considering what our intervention. Developing a process to notify the outpatient pharmacies of a patient's admission to hospital required consideration of an inclusion of all of the seven uh, Joint Commission key elements of transitions of care. This emphasized that even a small intervention or change idea required engaging multiple people and parts of a complex medical system to be implemented effectively. So upon admission to a Pasqua Hospital Accountable Care Unit Medicine Ward, the inpatient pharmacist performs medication reconciliation and the outpatient pharmacy is confirmed with the patient um, by the inpatient pharmacist at our daily bedside rounds. This was raising awareness for the patient is not routinely done, but is being implemented to improve safety and therefore provide better care to the The inpatient then completed the outpatient pharmacy notification fax uh, form and advised the outpatient pharmacy that the patient was admitted to hospital. This fax form also includes information to the pharmacist on how they can see when their patients are admitted to hospital and seeks their input to see if they feel this is relevant information and if there's anything more important that know all the patients are in the hospital. On discharge, the discharge medication reconciliation form signaled that the outpatient to the outpatient pharmacist that the patient has been discharged. Our fax notification form to outpatient pharmacies um, was piloted over a four week period. An audit process was performed to ensure that it was consistent. Of the seven patients during that four week period that we initially piloted, only Fax forms were able to be completed, and of those, 46 included all of the quality control criteria that we identified as important. This audit identified ways to increase the percentage of forms that could be faxed through small process changes on the inpatient pharmacist day sheet and prioritizing this process on Fridays and Mondays, since there's no unit coverage of pharmacists on the weekends, increasing the opportunity to, to miss new admissions after discharge. It also showcased the importance of accurate data collection of patients submitted to the unit by unit clerks, reinforcing the need for every team member to accurately perform their job duties in order to test the intervention and improve the process. After another couple PDSA cycles to formalize consistently, we've attained approval from the SHA Research Ethics Board to contact patients and outpatient pharmacists to explore the impact of this added communication intervention. A summary of the findings will be collated with the purpose of running further cycles on the notification tool to improve this and its utility. 
We'd like to get to a place where all patients admitted to hospital have their outpatient pharmacy notified of the admission as early as possible in the stay to reduce the risk of medication errors and diversion of controlled substances in the community. The Accountable Care Unit provides a standardized care delivered by an interdisciplinary team, which is a key component to implement a consistent process. But opportunities were lost for patients who did not make it onto an Accountable Care Unit ward prior to discharge, supporting the expansion of this care model across the hospital setting to improve patient care and, provi and care provider effectiveness and satisfaction. By partnering across transitions of care to determine best mod modalities of communication and effective interventions can reduce medication errors and inappropriate prescription drug use. Thank my coach, Ron Taylor, and my inpatient and outpatient pharmacy colleagues, Nelson Towers, Ken Bristol, Matt Manns, and my patient, Paula Kirk, and the research analyst, Michelle, for all their help on this project. And thanks to CQIP for giving me the tools to move it forward. Is someone going to pass the ball or do I do that? Oh, it looks like someone took it away. Yay. I got it. All right. Good morning, everyone. My name is Matthew Bradshaw. I'm a pediatric intensivist uh, at the Jim Patterson Children's Hospital in Saskatoon. Uh, my project is on improving access to pediatric organ donation in the pediatric intensive care unit. Uh, so a little bit of context for the project using historical data from Canadian blood services, uh, really here to illustrate that hundreds of patients die on waiting lists each year while waiting for organs in Canada, and that Saskatchewan in particular has lots of room for improvement when you look uh, in comparison to the Canadian average. Uh, our local context at the Jim Patterson Children's Hospital PICU um, showing deceased donor referral rates over time. The takeaway from this slide is that, uh, as you can see with the 42% median, less than half of eligible donors are referred to the donor program uh, in this snapshot. And it's really reflective that identification and referral of potential donors is discretionary and not standardized uh, in our unit. And so that was fruit for uh, improvement. Um, and our aim statement, um, was that we wanted all um, the, the families of all potential pediatric organ donors to have the opportunity to at least consider organ donation at the end of life. With um, so to achieve the goal, we identified factors um, involved in the donor identification and referral process, and those circled in green were targeted for improvement uh, and our improvement strategy. Uh, which I'll outline in the next slide. So we established uh, donor criteria in a simple referral tool. We developed standard process, uh, which I'll illustrate on the next slide, uh, really with a goal to create role clarity and reduce actual uh, or perceived conflicts of interest in really what is a delicate um, process and dance. Um, we highlighted two critical communication time points, uh, both yellow and red. And without going into too much detail, we thought we had it all nailed down. Um, and then we ran into a few roadblocks. Uh, one of the biggest hurdles to uh, implementation of this particular change and um, the Plan Do Study Act cycles was really culture. And it was a PICU culture dominated by risk aversion. The takeaway is that culture matters. Uh, in response to some of this, uh, we've teamed up with uh, ethics and legal to provide feedback, uh, help add robustness to the proposed change, and really to help build trust. We recognize it's gonna take time, but it's an important piece um, and leads me to really what I learned from the project. Uh, so the key learnings, the, um, we're really related to two things. The pandemic created an overworked stress team with reduced capacity for new projects. At one point, uh, the system uh, failed completely when the donor program staff were redeployed during the pandemic uh, and the donor program had to shut down. Uh, the donor program lead went on, L uh, sorry, lead went on LOA. Uh, lots of challenges related to the pandemic. Um, and then the last thing is really don't get bogged down by roadblocks. Change is a process. It's not a destination. You can't go at it alone. You need a team. Uh, and what I learned is to start small, to build as you go, and to learn from each experience. Thanks.
right, good morning. I'm Nicole Bootsman and I looked at post-operative orthopedic opioid prescribing for patients who are opioid naive. Opioid overprescribing after elective surgery can lead to chronic opioid use and studies have shown that around 80% of patients who used heroin reported an introduction to opioids via prescription. Up to 80% of opioids remain unused after elective surgery, leading to potential diversion and misuse. Patients who are opioid naive should require no more than 60 opioid containing tablets on discharge from total knee arthroplasty to manage post surgical pain while reducing opioid related risks. In analyzing drug claim data, I determined that 50% of patients who are opioid naive post total knee replacement received greater than 60 opioid containing tablets in some Saskatchewan centers. I further looked at a time comparison to assess whether a Canadian consensus publication in the Canadian Journal of Pain specifying quantity restrictions resulted in changed prescribing, which did not appear to be the case. In surveying Saskatchewan physicians as a whole, patient over-reliance on post-surgical opioids is problematic as only 32% of physicians self-reported either very or extremely confident in planning or carrying out opioid deprescribing. As a result of the data analytics, my aim statement is to reduce the number of opioid naive patients post total knee arthroplasty prescribed greater than or equal to 60 opioid containing tablets by regina orthopedic surgeons by 25%. After looking at the primary drivers and in order to get physician buy-in, I surveyed orthopedic surgeons to determine what would assist them to optimally prescribe to patients who are opioid naive? The survey results indicated a preference for a presentation on optimal prescribing. However, the time frame for my intervention had to be extended because our orthopedic colleagues are playing a bit of catch up right now. Hopefully, the fall will bring more promise for project completion and further evaluation given the background findings. Thank you to CQIP for some of my major learnings, including finding a champion, which is particularly important when implementing change for a group in a different profession, as well as essential to engage with those who are implementing the changes to ensure buy-in. And although we know that change is difficult, the pandemic seems to have reinforced this on a whole new level. So we need to continue to work together to incorporate evidence-based practices. Hi, my name is Silken. I am a R4 obstetrics and gynecology resident here in Saskatoon. Um, and my project was standardizing enhanced recovery after surgery for cesarean deliveries and does it make a difference, specifically on our C section infection rates. So, why does this matter? Well, a couple of things. One, it costs the healthcare system money. So, the average stay in hospital. Uh, in Canada is about $8,000 to $9,000. Given our number of C-sections and our C-section infection or the standard C-section infection rate across Canada, it's about two people a month um, or about $17,000. And um, the second point, kind of more important in my perspective, is that it really significantly impacts a woman's mental health. So. Readmission to hospital means time away from their family and negatively impacts their body image. And it increases rates of postpartum depression. So, how are we doing here in Saskatoon? Well, what kind of started me on this whole project was actually a um, data that came to our department in 2019 to show us that our C section infection rate had doubled. Um, and now, this was at a time as you pre-COVID and we had infection prevention and control actually helping us with looking at our more superficial infections out in the community. But given that their resources were needed elsewhere for this project, we really focused on our readmission rate. So admission to hospital in 2020 for C-section infections was about 1%. As you can see from the run chart, it was pretty steady there. There was no real trend either way. 
So we got a team together and decided that our aim, aim statement would be to reduce the readmission rate for C-section infection at JPCH by 50% by January 2023. And uh, the process, as everyone kind of before me and I'm sure after me will say, is taken as not exactly the way we thought it would go. So um, we started with looking at the evidence, what's out there and what are other centers doing to decrease their infection rate. Um, and that's where we came across enhanced recovery after surgery. It's been about mm, 15 years implemented in general surgery and in the last three to five years being studied specifically in obstetrics. And we looked at kind of our own process, as you can see with the process map of how people get into a C-section um, and their process afterwards. And really what we came to find as we were examining what happens in our center is that surgery isn't standardized. So it's not standardized before, um, the technique isn't standardized during and what happens after is very variable. And so we decided that standardizing the process, at least while they're in hospital, would be a good place to start. And so we developed a, we brought stakeholders together, department heads, nurse managers, bedside practitioners, pharmacy, our OR team, um, and developed a pre-printed order set and a pre and a standard OR process in order to um, see if this has any change. Some of the challenges that I think I've heard from some other people through this process is, um, first of all, we didn't have any place to actually collect the data. So we have three different charting spaces and actually um, none of them collected the data that we actually wanted to look at. So we could see our readmission rate, but we actually couldn't see what if people were getting what people were doing, if they were doing kind of our standard implementation and then what other things um, could be responsible for our infection rate. So we started and took a long time to kind of get information set up that we could chart it properly. And um, I thought a pre-printed order set would be as easy as making it, getting the powers that be to sign it and implement it, but uh, it's taken over a year for kind of that process. So our goals are to implement our pre-printed order set. It is on its way, hopefully by June 1st, and then we will analyze its uptake and it's more than 90%, we'll see if it actually impacts our readmission rate and then go from there. My reflections really have been kind of, I echo what everyone else has said in the beginning, um, but for my project in particular, first of all, make sure you have ways to collect the data. Um, we kind of skipped a few steps at the beginning um, and it's not always the problem you think it is. So. Uh, I think just looking at preliminary stuff, I'm not sure that this is really going to be the magic solution, but um, at least we have the team together now and it's a process. So, and it takes some time for change, just like the people above me have said. So thank you very much, Sequip, for letting me participate in this. And I'm excited to continue on with quality improvement in the future. Go ahead, Raj, you can advance. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Raj Kavanda. My project focuses on implementing a diabetes related uh, distress screening tool in Maple Creek Primary Health Clinic. The prevalence of diabetes related distress ranges from 18 to 45 percent among patients with diabetes, and it's more common than depression. It is associated with higher A1C, poor nutrition, and exercise behaviors. Both the ADA and CDA recommend that all patients with diabetes be screened for diabetes-related distress. We aim to screen all patients with type 2 diabetes that visit Maple Creek Primary Health Clinic. Having a team of providers and a validated diabetes-related screening tool are our primary drivers, Psychosocial screening assessment is our secondary driver. Our team has physicians, nurse practitioners, dietitian, diabetic educator, case manager, and office staff. Psychosocial screening provides an opportunity for open communication 
and building a relationship between patients and providers. Our planning included meetings reviewing ADA and CDA guidelines, ADA patient information leaflet, and red cap practice sessions. We mapped out the entire flow from the time the patient registered in the clinic and completed the scales to the end of the consultation. We used two scales, the DDS2 training tool um, is used as an initial training instrument followed by administering the complete DDS-13 questionnaire. The DDS-13 evaluates diabetes-specific problems, namely emotional burden, regimen-related distress, and diabetes-related interpersonal distress. Scores of three or higher is considered clinically meaningful distress. 59 patients completed the two-question training tool, 24 scored two or greater. 24 patients completed the DDS-13 questionnaire. 18 patients were experiencing little or no overall distress. Six patients were experiencing moderate distress. The highest level of distress is within the regimen distress subscale. Table one shows summary of the results. The next steps, the patient with diabetes distress can be referred to appropriate treatment. The patient with no distress will be screened in one year. Key learnings, I now appreciate our system, understand some of the issues that arise in our workplace and how people interact with each other in the units and changes in one sector can affect others. Using powerful tools like run charts and driver diagrams can be used to assess changes and performance. Many thanks to Tessa Ray, Michelle, Janelle, and Dr. Rojo Mariko. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Dr. Iggy. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Iggy Olabo, I'm Information Physician here in Norfolk. So my project title is uh, Improving Patient Handover Process in Melford uh, Hospital. Proper transfer of care between providers is a very important uh, uh, point in providing quality health care to our patients. And uh, a short observation study that was done in Norfolk Hospital Ward confirmed that uh, it's a problem in a hospital. The aim statement of this research is to improve patient handover process and to reduce medical errors uh, on our wards by 10 percent uh, by uh, June 30, 2022. Working with the team that uh, was uh, composed, we were able to identify the factors uh, that uh, contribute to poor patient handover. We used the fishbone di diagram, the five whys, and the pro process map to identify the, the problems that are involved. And using this data, we're able to decide to use the handover document uh, using the IS bar uh, approach as the data collecting, collecting tool. And using uh, doing series, I mean, different uh, PDSAs, we're able to adapt the two to our local environment and also, more importantly, to not make it uh, a process that will increase workload for our patients, I mean, for our physicians, uh, which uh, will affect uh, the buy in. The next step. Uh, we are still collecting the data, and after the data collection process is complete, we plan to analyze the data with the team and develop a work standard, which will be presented to the uh, local MAC uh, team uh, to approve uh, the document before uh, implementation. The key learnings for me are that uh, there are lots of uh, improvement ideas that we can work on, however, it is very important to make sure that your improvement idea is smart because there are lots of variables that are outside our control, which would determine the success or otherwise of your project. Also, 
it is important to compose uh, your team to increase your brain power and improve the validity of the projects. And uh, it is very important to realize that uh, improvement uh, efforts take time. So before I round up, I want to say thank you to the um, Health Air Quality Council and all the stakeholders uh, for giving me this opportunity to open my eyes to improve my projects and more importantly, to have the skill to actually do something about the problems that uh, we're surrounded with. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name's Kirsten, um, and I'm one of the pharmacists in the Saskatchewan Health Authority here in Regina. And I'm happy to talk to you about my pro my project, implementing electronic handoff in home IV patients receiving vancomycin. So the World Health Organization definition of transitions of care is on the slide. Um, but put very simply, transitions of care are all the different points that a patient goes through during their health care um, admissions or when they're receiving health care services. And these points in care can be either geographical locations or different practitioners. And as was mentioned earlier, transitions of care are very vulnerable times for patients, um, largely because it puts them at increased risk of experiencing adverse effects or medical errors that are due to a myriad of re reasons. Um, but some common ones are really communication related issues between transitions of care. So an example in Regina that ended up being the focus of my project was any patients who are prescribed intravenous vancomycin can at some point be initiated and admitted to the home IV vanco program, which is an outpatient kind of an ambulatory care program. And so these patients, along with that being a transition of care, also have their drug monitoring completed by multiple um, SHA Regina pharmacists. So to help improve this transition of care process and reduce um, adverse effects that may occur, by December 22, the AIM statement is to achieve 50% documentation rate for all for pharmacist interventions when they're completing therapeutic drug monitoring for patients receiving vancomycin. So I've included the driver di uh, diagram here. We identified four primary di drivers as well as a multitude of secondary drivers. Um, but for the sake of a three minute presentation, I'll just focus on the primary driver communication, which is where we um, implemented our change ideas. For, so for the secondary drivers, we identified that standardized forms um, were only available in BDM, which is our pharmacist dispensing program. And what this means is that other healthcare providers wouldn't be able to see any of our rationale for drug dose adjustments. Uh, other secondary drivers was that patient follow-up was recorded within the pharmacy, but it wasn't permanent. So if you wanted to go back or if other uh, practitioners wanted to see it, that wouldn't be available. Pharmacist therapeutic drug monitoring is new within um, SHA, um, but it's only for inpatients. It hadn't been used for outpatients. And as well, we did have double documenting. So some change ideas were to implement pharmacist documentation on SCM, which is the electronic medical record. We also thought standardizing documentation would be ideal, given that there's evidence to suggest that this improves transitions of care. And then we also wanted to update our internal ward work list. So in March 2022, we implemented a standardized electronic pharmacist documentation tool for patients on vancomycin in the home IV program. We did a baseline chart review just to see what our electronic documentation rates were like for patients prior to being admitted to the home IV program. We saw that about 20% did have electronic documentation. So we know it is being used. It was just not being used yet in the home IV patients. And so you can see um, the black line in the center really is when we implemented the intervention. And we can see after that with the orange, um, by the end of the month, we had 10% documentation. And at the end of April, it had jumped up to 66%. Um, when I collected the data in early May, there wasn't any, inter it was too early at this point. And so I think um, we still have room to improve and see if we can maintain our documentation above the 50% target. So key reflections and learnings is that change takes time and it's not always easy. And that's largely due to, as everyone knows, that the healthcare system is very complex and there's multitude of stakeholders, which led into my second major learning is that teamwork is very vital to make sure you're involving stakeholders so that way they can be engaged and motivated to um, facilitate change. 
And then it was also a change in mindset with QI. So instead of leaning with the solution, lead with the problem and to continuously ask, keep asking why to help with QI. Um, so thank you everyone. And just thank you to the Sequip project program um, for allowing me to join and I've learned a ton. So thank you. Well, hi everyone. For those that don't know me, my name is Joel Mampshire. I'm a physician based at Regina and Moose Jaw. So my project looked at improving recognition, physician documentation, and communication of malnutrition on 3D at the Pasqua Hospital in Regina, Saskatchewan. So in speaking to why I, I chose the project and why I feel it's important, malnutrition is a common and often under-recognized problem in adult inpatients across Canada, uh, with up to one in two adult inpatients being malnourished in the hospital. This can lead to significant negative outcomes to both patient morbidity and mortality in really increase healthcare expenditure. So my project built upon previous research done through the Morty program at the Pasqua Hospital in Regina, Saskatchewan, aligned with the Canadian Malnutrition Task Force by doing a physician survey of the Cannibal Care Unit hospitalists um, and, this, and uh, uh, associate chart review before and after two nutrition education sessions. I was hoping to get a better idea of the existing problem and potential solutions to optimizing the recognition, documentation of, and communication surrounding malnutrition. So due to the time constraints of this talk, I'm not gonna go too in depth to my driver diagram, but it is available for anyone that wants to have a look afterwards. Um, key primary drivers were improving communication between dietitians and physicians and improved consistency of physician documentation of malnutrition. Key outcome measures were pre-survey and progress note audits and post-survey progress and progress note audits, uh, both before and after a targeted education session. So in speaking to where we're at right now, we're currently in the second part of our data collection phase. We completed primary data collection and analyzed and are looking to apply further PDSA cycles from that data. So overall, just speaking of learning and learnings and reflections, I feel about research, I learned to expect more delays and road bumps and really learn to expect and embrace change. And about myself, I really felt that I was more confident after going through the program with being in leadership situations and a little bit more comfortable in public speaking. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you to the CQIP program for really allowing me to start on my quality improvement journey. And thanks to everyone for listening to me talk today. everyone, this is Zinia Abdel Malik, family physician from Saskatoon. Uh, my project was uh, enhancing daily intake of D3 among the Arabic speaking population. And just to give you a little background, in a 2017 report, the cost of osteoporosis on the system reached $4.6 billion. And um, it's known by literature and research that low D3 and calcium deficiency are two of the most important modifiable risk factors to prevent osteoporosis. It was also indicated that D3 levels in intake were found to be low among immigrants and refugees compared to just the general population. Ethnicity, skin type and color, lack of knowledge and some cultural practices lead to this issue, which in turn can lead to rickets, osteomalacia, osteoporosis, and of course, prevention is key to good bone health. I work in a primary care setting with immigrants and refugees, and that made the perfect place to um, initiate the CQIP program. The aim statement was basically enhancing adherence to vitamin D3 daily intake among the Arabic speaking population of our clinic. By 35% by end of April 2022, it was a patient focused approach. So, uh, in order to achieve our goal, uh, we build a team. Um, we included patient advisor um, providers and, of course, a huge team of patients. We needed to identify the cause root of the problems and find the whys. We had a fish bone when I started. I thought it's just one reason um, that patients basically forget to take the medication. But the fish bone, by the time I was done, I found 17 different reasons. So um, we also had to think and decide on ways of measurements. We designed and modified questionnaires and we provided educations. We did a lot of communications. 
four PDSA cycles were introduced and patients were requested to do self-charting with each PDSA cycle for two reasons, actually. One, self-commitment as part of each PDSA. Two, for data collection and measurements at the end of this process. So um, the first PDSA cycle basically was providing education. Second, provide a solution. Third, um, we requested patients to have their own solutions, so patient-driven solutions. And the fourth one, we provided prescription along with the above. Then when it came to the measurements, we chose two different ways. First, we used run charts and we learned that the percent of patients who had D3 on daily basis reached 42%. And the percent of patients who had D3 50% or more of the time reached 60%. And we also did pill count for four patients, and all four counts were true. And um, this is the first drawn chart, patients taking D3 on daily basis. This is the second one. And um, what I learned, change is doable, it takes time, and it cannot be imposed. Understanding the root cause from the patient perspective is important. Patient likes the approach, children have fun. Um, data is a, uh, analysis is a huge issue and I need to learn more. And at the end, I just want to say thank you so much for everyone and CK faculty and team. I appreciate, thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Keely Gartner. I'm calling from Treaty 6 territory in the homeland of the Métis. And my project was entitled Improving Opiate Agonist Therapy Treatment at the Westside Community Clinic. Our team's overall aim was to create a holistic treatment approach for people living with obese disorder and accessing care at the Westside Community Clinic. We had to divide this into two more achievable aims, which were number one, by May 2022, create a process for missed opiate agonist therapy or OAT appointments, and number two, by May 2022, begin a process for regular patient feedback. We created a process map and from that created the following driver diagram and fishbone diagrams. We identified missed OAT appointments as our first area of focus, as we noted variability between clinicians and confusion amongst our team. Missed OAT appointments were also a significant part of the addiction counselor's workload, time better spent interacting with patients. We measured missed OAT appointments at baseline and noted about a 40% no-show rate. Engagement on OAT pharmacotherapy is an important indicator of quality, as high engagement reduces mortality and morbidity for people with opiate use disorder. Proactive prescription management strategies are demonstrated in the literature to improve engagement. Our first PDSA cycle was to create a standard missed appointment process by engaging our interdisciplinary team. We then communicated this change to our staff and patients. We will continue to measure the administrative workload for the addiction counselor to determine if our new process increases time for counseling and other therapeutic interactions. Our second PDSA cycle was to increase patient engagement. We started by hosting a group feedback session for quality improvement ideas guided by our patients. Our key reflections were that building a QI team during the pandemic when our staff was already overstretched and often burnt out was a challenge. However, the chance to step out of our daily roles and think about the bigger picture was well received by our team and we plan to continue uh, monthly meetings for moving our quality improvement ideas forward. We were able to standardize our missed OAT appointment process and time will tell if, with our measures if this was a positive change and if we can sustain it moving forward. People accessing OAT at Westside were eager to engage with groups. To increase participation of patient partners in the future for those experiencing structural barriers to good health, we would suggest options such as a cash honorarium, ensuring food, transportation, and childcare are funded for future CCREP projects. Thank you so much for your time.
Okay, I think I have the ball, but I don't know. Here we go. Okay, thanks everybody. So my name is Erin uh, Cuttington. I am a physician that works in Regina uh, with the Accountable Care Unit team. Um, my project was looking at antimicrobial stewardship and specifically asymptomatic bacteria and um, a look at whether discussing it in a standardized way at our bedside rounds would um, reduce antibiotic use for um, the indication of asy asymptomatic bacteria. Our aim statement and what we wanted to do is reduce the number of antibiotic days for asymptomatic bacteria by 50% on a medical ward at the Pasqua Hospital by June of 2023. So obviously the project is still ongoing. Um, the antimicrobial stewardship team and the accountable care unit physicians had a desire to uh, improve the appropriateness of antibiotic stewardship in our acute care setting. Um, the antimicrobial stewardship had already been doing some point prevalence surveys about antibiotic use on our medical ward. So we were able to use this as some of our baseline data and found that um, for their point prevalence surveys, asymptomatic bacteria seemed to be the most uh, commonly um, common use of antibiotics on our wards on a few different point prevalence surveys. And obviously, um, asymptomatic bacteria is not supposed to be treated with antibiotics, uh, so it was one that was inappropriate 100% of the time. Uh, so we use this point prevalence survey to sort of help us scope our project, um, as obviously antimicrobial stewardship is a large, a large thing to try to tackle all at once. Um, as you can see, we had uh, a lot of different change ideas about how to um, tackle this problem um, because of the existing structure that we had with the um, interdisciplinary rounds. We decided to leverage this to see if we could standardize a process to discuss the appropriateness of antibiotic therapy um, and specifically um, asymptomatic bacteria at our bedside rounds. Uh, to put this into place, we engaged our antimicrobial stewardship team, of course, um, the unit management, the um, pharmacists that actually worked day to day with the physicians on the unit, the pharmacy um, and we did involve some of our patient and family partners with the um, sort of where we got to with the project, their role was quite minor, but um, going forward, they will certainly have more input, which is wonderful. Um, due to multiple delays, I think as everybody else has had, um, we were only able to get very preliminary data collection um, and it was mostly um, like a process audit uh, for the first PDSA cycle that we um, put in place. One of the surprising things was that it looked like we didn't have very many um, antibiotics that were discussed at our bedside rounds, which of course was surprising. Um, however, when we discussed this with one of our um, students that was helping with the data collection, uh, it ended up being a problem with definitions just because she assumed that the pharmacist saying the patient isn't on antibiotics meant that it wasn't discussed. And that was just a difference in opinion um, about whether it was discussed or not. So um, that number doesn't look great, but on clarification, and working with the team, we found out that it was just a communication error. As far as next step for the projects, more data collection is what we're going to be doing. So we're going to be looking for more data to see whether our intervention is actually going to be successful because we haven't started to collect any of that data. So that's going to be our next steps for the project. And as far as key learnings and reflections from the project, but also from CQIP is uh, dream big, but start small. So scoping the project is really important. I think we all have grand ideas about what think, ways that we can make this system better, but just making sure that the, the project is doable um, and a reasonable scope is really important. Obviously, my personal experience is that definitions are very important to making sure that all of your team members are on the same page. And then one of the last things that I thought was really key is um, finding a way to feed the uh, results back to the team that you're working with is really important to make sure that you have their engagement um, in your QI project. So feeding it back to the frontline workers is obviously uh, an important next step and we look forward to working through that. And finally, thank you to the Secret program, uh, my coaches and all the fellow participants for making this a wonderful, fulfilling course. I can't wait to continue doing QI work. Thank you everybody for all the hard work. It's it's very, it's not surprising, uh, but at the same time, it's very humbling to see how much work and effort has gone into what everybody has done over the last few months. It seems like we only started yesterday, but given everything that was presented today, I, I was like, oh my goodness, that's a lot of work. 
and I have an idea of how much goes on in the background that's you know even when you're not in the learning lab sessions there's a lot of work going on in emails and communication and I, we can't thank you all for your commitment to the program and you know this is just the beginning like everybody has said uh, it's really worth commending all the effort that you have put in um, and on behalf of all the faculty team members we really want to commend you on that and thank you for believing in us that we trust you that you can do the work, even when they do something like that at the beginning. And we all sort of have uh, cerebral overload right now. I think we need a break to restore our caffeine status. My caffeine level is low for sure. Uh, so we're going to break for about um, nine minutes. We'll come back at 9.30 and then we'll start again. See you soon. And refreshing you yourself and then refill your coffee mugs. See you in a bit. Welcome back, everybody. Our next speaker is a no stranger to all of us who have been on this YouTube journey for, for some time. Um, I had the pleasure of being, of knowing Mary at, a, I will not say on a personal level, but we were in the same cohort called two, which in my totally unbiased opinion, still the best cohort so far. Um, so she was a participant like myself, and ever since she finished a secret project, she has been involved in the secret community at one level of the other. I know she's a coach. She's been a coach ever since she completed that program. And it's always a pleasure to have her back um, with us. As everyone who's been in this current cohort knows that whenever Mary comes to join us, it's never a dull moment because she asks very stimulating question and gets everybody involved. So it's no surprise to us that she's agreed, kindly agreed to, to be a keynote presenter today. She is um, the division head for anatomic pathology for the SHA in Saskatoon. She completed her residency in the U of S and then went on to UBC to complete a fellowship in gynecological pathology. So she's currently employed as a um, specialist, sub, subspecialist pathology with the um, SHA and U of S and also a clinical associate professor with the University of Saskatchewan, as well in the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine. She is currently involved in research on the molecular classification of endometrial carcinoma, and also quality improvement and standardization work within the anatomical pathology. She sits as the chair for the anatomic pathology in the province. She is a president for the Saskatoon Medical staff association she's also the volunteer chair, chair for the women living philanthropic campaign for the royal university hospital foundation on an international level she is the international project she is leading an international project on BRAF. i don't know what BRAF stands for with a consortium of analytical standardization and immunochemistry and also for those who may not know her she is a mom to very energetic children which keeps her on her too she likes to play uh, with Frisbee, if that's the correct, Mary, um, if I'm wrong, I apologize for that. But I do re remember that she likes to play Frisbee and it is with great honor and a pleasure to welcome Mary to our, to our meet this morning for us to give our keynote address. Mary, over to you. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Shade. Like, that is very kind of you. And yes, it is my 10 year old daughter's birthday today and I do have a six year old son as well too. So there'll be celebrations this evening. And and thank you so much uh, to Sequit for having me here. It was a true honor to be asked to give this commencement address to the graduating class. And as Shade mentioned, I was part of that star-studded cohort in um, the second class, which included Kevin Wasco and Sarah Linz and, and Shaquille Pierre Mohammed and Henrik Duplus and Lexi Regush. And you will have seen that these have all become leaders within our healthcare system for quality improvement. And that's what we see for this graduating cohort as well too. Um, 
I am talking to you from Treaty 6 territory today, uh, the homeland of the Métis in my office in Saskatoon. And I recognize that there is difficulties in delivering a virtual address because I, I wanted this to be more of a discussion, but I do have my PowerPoint presentation here. And um, I, I recognize also that there is difficulty with the um, WebEx in, in advancing um, slides that have animation in them. So I will just, uh, you'll just have to bear with me because it doesn't have the animation in it. Okay, so I can see that I am the presenter and um, I'm just gonna try and advance the slides, but I don't seem to be able to do it, which is too bad because I'm just gonna see. Just click on your screen, the controls should show up. Mm hmm and I'm looking for a. There's, there should be a 127 at the top of the slide and there's a little right arrow that you should be able to click there. Got it. Thank you. So what I'm talking about today through sustainability and quality improvement is where you're going from here. And a little bit of this talk is going to be somewhat of my journey and what has happened since I graduated. And some of it's going to be. Um, the lessons learned that are outside of the medical aspect, which has been pretty much the pivotal part um, since graduating from CEQIP. So as Shade mentioned, I, I do work as a gynecologic pathologist and within anatomic pathology, and I am the provincial lead for anatomic pathology, and this is not to be confused with uh, the provincial head as this role, the provincial lead, doesn't come with any protected time or remuneration or any authority whatsoever. It just comes with some responsibility. But it's important to talk about the journey then uh, of where the QI has taken from being um, in the privileged position to allow for strategic direction of pathology within Saskatchewan. So where I was, after my CEQIP graduation in 2018 was you have this sense of accomplishment. I mean, what we've seen from the past 12 presentations is that there is an immense amount of learning, an immense amount of diversification within the Saskatchewan Health Authority of interventions in places where we are improving. And that these are like lead us to be on such a high of like, we are getting something accomplished and we are going to change healthcare, which is cer certainly what I felt afterwards too. And in reality, since 2018, it has been a variable amount of ups and downs. And this is a two dimensional slide, but if I could, I would show you three dimensions here of not only ups and downs of where things started and stopped, but how they have branched out into other things. And this is just a snapshot and not even an exact, um, exhaustive snapshot of the different types of quality improvements that we have implemented within anatomic pathology in SHA. And uh, all of these utilized the skills that were brought forth with CEQIP. And as Shade also mentioned is that, yes, I went through it in 2018, but I continue to come back to the program because every time I develop a more fulsome approach to what is uh, making quality improvement a success. And I'm learning from everybody that is um, participating as well too, because it, it does become very narrowed where you're working within your subspecialty and um, you're not, we don't always get to see patients either. So uh, it always is nice to have that direct line to patients. And the most uh, probably pivotal aspect was like all of you have mentioned this iterative process where you're not finished and it is continuing to work on the, um, the skills that you have started to cultivate with CQIP. And I'm going to build your attention here uh, to the fact that a lot of this isn't within that medical um, expertise knowledge. 
that we value so highly for so much of our medical career. And it was a real shock. So 2018, um, started practice in 2013. So uh, probably started the secret program in 2017, two years out of practice. I was a young division head, so I was already division head. Um, and at that point or to that point, the only thing that I could think of that mattered was standards, guidelines, the medical knowledge, and as long as everybody knew what the diagnostic criteria was, then I am unclear why anyone has any different thought than what I had. Because we had all taken the same Royal College and we had all had the same training and we all worked in anatomic pathology. And that was a real barrier to me that to the fact that number one, I didn't really know myself. I knew my analytic self, I knew my medical self, and it really was coming into the CQIP course. And it was specifically module four. And these are my original notes that I keep in my office from module four because of how moving that this day was to me. So we had it in person. And I had never thought about this before, and, and this is very exposing and, and vulnerable because I was at this point, I'm 36 years old, 37 years old. And to think that you never had thought about this before, but every time I had looked in words to make a decision uh, for something in the lab, because at that level of division head, you have some of those responsibilities. I was constantly thinking what would. Fergal do, who was the previous division head, or what would Blake do, who was my fellowship director? And not like, and it came as news to me that I wasn't a 50 something year old man, but that I had my own values and that I had my own um, uh, past and that I was coming into it with my own perspective. And we had to do this exercise where we had to think about a few specific events that gave me fulfilling and pride at work or not at work. And um, we were paired up with someone and I was paired up with a pharmacist from outside of Saskatoon. And as you can see, mine were the thread that happened with mine was that it was Success, adapt, overcome, any cost, make sure that the goal is achieved. And I, I remember going first, because of course I went first and it was talking. And and I'm proud of all of these things. I'm proud of the fact that I was the first female to graduate from university and in, in my family on both sides. And I'm proud of being part of the Canadian military for four years when I was younger and passing my Royal College and and being able to give a national conference uh, talk two years out and um, and being division head. And then I, I went and I listened to my colleague who was giving his why. And I, I mean, I was, by the end of it, I was a, a puddle of tears because it was so different and beautiful. And the stories that he gave were, and I still have them here, that his, the elements that he gave were talking about events that were small, but so meaningful in other people's lives and taking those small bits of life and making sure that they are valued in the moment and felt and enjoyed. And it was, and I can remember exactly how I felt and thinking, oh my God, mine is so shallow. And I, I had to pause there for a second. And when I said it out loud, the facilitator came through and he, and he said, I, 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 don't, I don't think that that's what you should be taking away from it, but not one is not better than the other, but it was really at that moment that I thought, people really do think differently than I do. And a lot of what I'm thinking is, can be considered pretty one dimensional. And if I don't have that other dimension and that diversification, I am missing a lot here. And that went on to serve as a, a somewhat of a beacon for 
how we develop teams over the course of the next three years. And really when we're diving into these essence of the whys, a lot of it ended up being that we were, I was trying to make sure that things, when I did have the ability to create and make decisions and I have a unique skill set for solving problems, um, that I was really trying to make an equitable and fair playing field for people to uh, be able to succeed and, and thrive. And so my why statement um, for what gets me up in the morning is that I wake up inspired to facilitate and solve problems so that other people have a fair and equitable grounds to achieve success. And that was the first aspect of bringing together a team um, that we have and, and realizing that I am not an N of one in the group that I work with in the health authority. And being able to come back to that has led to this sustained focus um, on what we can do with quality improvement over the next three years. So, so where I started back in 2018 is that I was interested in tissue preservation um, for molecular diagnostics, which we'll get into. And there was, um, we were successful and integrated the CQIP project. And at this point, we don't even measure it anymore because it has a 99.9% .9 success rate. And so um, prior to introduction, we had a 35%, so um, a 35% failure rate, so a 65% success rate. Patients that needed specific molecular diagnostics to access therapy had their tissue, had no tissue available. They just didn't have any tumor tissue left to be able to test for these specific mutations, so they couldn't access therapy. So I attribute the CQIP course and this particular driver diagram to really pinpointing about where the choice was to intervene. And I was so lucky because if you don't have enough tissue, you have a couple of different options. You can either choose to get more tissue or you can choose how to use the tissue differently. And I'm so happy that I chose to use the tissue differently because that was under my control. If I was going over to um, tissue received, then I am thinking I have to go over to the interventional radiology world and that is none on, that I do not have any sphere of influence there. Um, so I'm so happy. So with the tissue that we had, we were able to increase that success rate to 99.9%. And additionally to the success from the CQIP project is that I've been able to use the learnings that I've had to get a number, these are the two that I hold right now, but a number of education grants um, for uh, investigating further aspects of molecular diagnostics uh, for different, uh, for different projects and I, I th this one was particularly competitive and my colleague in uh, Vancouver who's a little bit senior to me also applied for it and it was the same project and and I was successful and and they didn't get it and I definitely attribute that to the fact that I knew how to uh, write an aim statement and a driver diagram and be able to coalesce it into something that makes meaningful results from the CQIP program but um, the implementing change part has always been a bit of a struggle for me and it, and it is something that I still struggle with because it is making that switch um, that is, is very scary to me that now I'll, I'll continue to talk about it and go through my journey a little bit on how I'm working with that because that continues to be something that I, I uh, I go back to and have to really have a lot of um, internal thought about. So the values that I hold that um, kind of integrate with my why statement is that I feel that all cancer patients, regardless of where you live in Saskatchewan, should have equitable access to precision oncology therapy. So if you are a cancer patient, then you should have the same access to the precision drugs, not just the blanket chemotherapy, that anyone else in Saskatoon, Regina, or wherever you have your cancer diagnosed, 
And it shouldn't be reliant on the fact that one pathologist knows more than the other pathologist and that it just is a matter of which pathologist read your pathology and which oncologist that you get. And so in my mind, access in this context refers to having an appropriate turnaround time and having access to those companion diagnostics and then access to the clinical trials because the clinical trials are dependent on the turnaround time. You have a certain amount of time to get on a clinical trial. If anything is delayed, you miss that window. So I'll talk about what our companion diagnostics just briefly and ask Shade's, uh, answer Shade's um, question about what a, what a BRAF is. So companion diagnostics are meant for a patient with a specific type of cancer in a specific organ, and they give information to use a specific type of drug for that. So you have a patient that has colorectal cancer or melanoma, say, and a part of their tumor tissue is already in the lab, and we perform specialized testing. And this is a little bit reductive, but, but for the most part, if the mutation is present, then there's a certain type of therapy, and if the mutation is absent, there's another type of therapy. So the BRAF is something that's mutated in both melanoma and colorectal cancer, and you need to have that molecular analytic diagnostic to be able to access therapy. And in colorectal cancer, it's that you're going to end up um, not getting the EGFR receptor inhibitor, but in melanoma, it means that you are going to get a BRAF inhibitor. So, um, so what that means is that the oncologists need that information to be able to plan for the patient's journey going through. And the earlier that they have that information, then the earlier they can start making those decisions without delay. So we went through some of the pre-analytic data and there is a journey and we, I'll show you the mapped out process, but um, the turnaround time um, is, a, is something that we use a, a lot. And the Advanced Diagnostic Research Lab is affiliated with our lab. It's not in my lab here. Um, but it's just across the river over at the university. So that's the only one that we have in the province. And the turnaround time, once we got the tumor tissue to the molecular lab, super stable, nine days. You can set your watch by it. You know that if you get it there, in nine days, the oncologist will have the result. The turnaround time from the cancer clinic to getting the referral in the pathology lab to have that test done wildly unstable but this is not in my control i'm not going over to the cancer clinic and making uh, decisions or micromanaging in what their uh, processes are and like we're, somebody should we should have an oncologist go through the sequit program and that they can be empowered to do that but there was also another type of unstable turnaround time and that was from the time that the pathologist made the surgical diagnosis to the time that it did get to the ADRL molecular lab. It was also unstable. And so we had a look at why that is in my control. So we had a look at what the interventions were and, and how we could um, improve that. And really the overall goals of that funded project were to increase pathologist and technologist proficiency in what happens before the tissue actually gets to the molecular lab. And let's determine some of the optimal guidelines and testing algorithms for colorectal cancer and melanoma on a provincial level. So it's working for all patients and not just those in Saskatoon. And then ensuring, and, and really this is the overall goal. So if I really wanted to have my story is that I want to make sure that the oncologist has that molecular information so that the day that the patient comes and sees them, that they're able to make decisions right there and that they're not having to order a BRAF and that the patient has to come back and, and wait. So this is the path. The patient, and because there's no animations here, I, I would be interested to see if you can actually find where I did the intervention. The patient receives the biopsy. It comes to the pathology lab, uh, and we put it in a tissue block and examine it by the pathologist. And it's examined by the pathologist. And we issue out a diagnostic surgical report to the clinician. This clinician is the same as this clinician. The clinician then refers to oncologist 
and the oncologist who reviews the referral and the surgical diagnostic pathology report then makes another referral back to the pathologist. This pathologist is the same as this pathologist. The pathologist repulls the case, does the required testing, issues the molecular uh, result to the oncologist. This person's the same as this person. And then finally, the patient can have access to the precision therapy. So what this shows is that really, this entire process here is redundant. If the pathologist is just able to issue or, and redirect reflexively the molecular diagnostics, we do not need this entire gap and delay of people, which accumulates to about three weeks, which when you're already having a delay on this end, it really does put the patients at a critical um, uh, step for being able to access the clinical trials. So we did map the process and provided some interventions and we have a testing phase. So this is a year long project. And we, the one thing I have learned is that I did these small testing phases because I have done many things where I've got to the end and I was like, ooh, I wish I would have done that differently. So they're broken up into three month chunks and I'll, we'll show you what uh, ended up happening. And I won't go through all of this, but I'm, I'm but this will come up uh, about why this is important specifically for me and, and how my mind works. Um, but this needed to be done. I needed to have it visually on paper. And you can see that this is the new process. This is the, the blue is the redundant process. These two things, these are two new things that we need to do in the lab. This is something that we don't have SOPs for and that the pathologists haven't done before. Usually we just are very passive about it. And then uh, BRAF for colorectal cancer is a little bit more difficult because we have um, biopsies and surgical excisions and it's just a, not a standard process. But you can see that the, um, the purple is a lot more uh, streamlined than it is for the blue, which we're hoping is going to be redundant. So the intervention that we used was reflexive testing from the pathologist. So it was really empowering the team. They're going from something where they were passively told what to do by oncologists. And now we're saying you have, you have the molecular literacy. Like the pathologists are just as capable of knowing what the pathway is for um, oncologic processes. We don't have the always the patient perspective we, so there's always going to be cases where uh, patients are going to be too sick, decide not to accept therapy, or for other various reasons are not going to be eligible. But we think that talking to, after talking to the pathologist and the oncologist, that having the support system to um, be there for all cancer patients, even though there are going to be some patients that aren't going to accept it, that we needed to kind of raise the safety network for all of them that we can get that testing for everybody even if not everybody's going to take advantage of it that costs money but um, we were able to show that it actually saved enough time and and was valuable so um but we had to agree upon these reflexive testing criteria the testing costs about uh, five hundred dollars per patient um so we needed to have an uh, agreed upon uh, way to to reflex these patients and what criteria and it's harder than you think because everybody knows in medicine that you constantly have these maps going on in your head where you're able to change and pivot things and accumulate new information but to put it two dimensionally on a page is actually quite difficult oops so education for the tumor content and the block punching for both pathologists and technologists, that was another major hurdle for us in generating the um, SOP generation in the lab. And, and this, the tumor content and block punching are, it would be equivalent to like, um, you know, if you went through residency, I guess I think like if you were a re uh, radiologist and you went through residency and they didn't have MRI and then <laughs> MRI was brought in like halfway through yeah, the, when you were practicing as a radiologist and you had to learn something like that. It's probably not as complicated. But it's something that is daunting for sure. And so I'll just show you some of the testing phase information that um, the, this is from the colon, the colorectal side. 
that the BRAP turnaround time from the time that the pathologist signed it out to the time that ADRL signed it out was extensive. So we're looking at up to 30 days and you can say, okay, well, nine of those days it is taken up by ADRL doing the testing, which is kind of baked in. You can't re really get it less than nine days, but still that's three weeks. Like what the heck is happening between the time it's signed out for three weeks before it's getting on the machine to ADRL. And so when we, we did uh, break it down between those that were reflexing and, um, I, and those that uh, were referred by the cancer clinic, and you can see now we get it down to about two weeks here. So if you're taking away the um, nine days for, the cancer, for uh, ADRL sign out, we're getting down to about five days and um, I haven't included all the steps here, but the steps are that it has to go back to the deeper bench. You have to cut scrolls, then you have to send it to ADRL. So it has to be packed up, it has to be unpacked, then it has to be registered and DNA has to be extracted. So that is actually pretty good. But like we, we still have this why we still have a number of patients that are getting uh, cancer agency orders. So this is incumbent upon the oncologist to have to order these tests. And you can see this, that it's, you know, you know, as we start to get down into different months that these start to get smaller and smaller numbers, but it, it seems like there's this bulk around this time frame here, but this is able to highlight that we are missing patients. Like we shouldn't be having patients that have to wait this long. And probably what happens is that this is progression and I just, I have a very fundamental um, and, and personal philosophy that because this is a driver mutation, this will be present right at the time of diagnosis, that once a patient has already progressed, that they shouldn't have to then wait for testing before they get therapy. Like that, it should be progression and, and documented progression and then treatment right away because we had it available a hundred days ago. So melanoma is interesting because, and, and it's a different group. Um, in Saskatoon, we have subspecialists sign out. So we have a team of four dermatopathologists rather than, uh, so this is different than say in Regina, which uh, practices a, in a generalist model. So if you can imagine that you had to remember all of the different molecular criteria for every tumor that you signed out, that one of it would get missed. And we have found that having or dermatopathologist, so you get to have your neighborhood pathologist on speed dial, so you can ask any questions that you need rather than having to talk to um, 14 different introverts at any given time, then that would be a benefit to different teams. So they're a pretty engaged bunch with the dermatologist and they have mutually agreed upon, they're like, this is when we're gonna order this for you. You can guarantee that it's going to be available to you. So when you're, when you're looking at like uh, 16 days and you're taking away the nine days, we're getting into pretty good territory, but we still have some variation month by month. And that's, I think, because um, I, I do think it's because Re Regina is in part of that, because when we looked at it and broke it down, 80% uh, of the eligible melanoma patients were reflexed from Saskatoon and compared to 30% from Regina in this testing window. Um, you can see the big difference there. So, um, yeah, this, this one here, like we had to investigate this and this is actually um, my fault. So we can talk about how uh, we're gonna talk about again, that implementation change and that scariness when you're making the switch. Yeah, so this is, again, just to show that all of these patients have such a wide range that there has to be something non-standard there. This is like a, 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 a special cause variation. So these are the course corrections that we've made from that first learning cycle uh, and PDSA. Like, so yes, reflexing was happening in Saskatoon over Regina, and so we sent a reminder through the division head and asked them how they would like to be communicated with. We did have the education session, but how would they like to receive their feedback? And I can say over the last couple of weeks, it's been much better, but I, I don't envision that this is going to be something that 
well, I've done my piece and I can like coast away here is it, this is going to be something for a, a real change in habit um, for the Saskatoon group. They really just need positive feedback. I, I mean, they're very engaged and they want to be able to do, um, transition into this new type of practice. And so we just really have to provide them with the resources that they need to succeed. The, the ones that didn't get reflexed in uh, Saskatoon were the were patients that had multiple metastases. And we just needed to narrow down and have a definition about what we were doing in these uh, special uh, patient cases. And this is why I was so happy that we like did that little tiny PDSA in this course correction is because we have I, I heard a lot of people saying that the data wasn't there, the data wasn't in the right format, the data definition wasn't um, the same as what I would describe as a, I felt all of that too. And what we had to do for this project and what we have implemented at the molecular lab is that we have somebody just doing databases for what we need for this information. Uh, the goal is that this will be captured automatically in a lab information system and that province plan is ongoing, but, and it will happen in my lifetime, but it's not happening quickly enough for me to be able to use it. But thanks to the Pfizer grant, we're able to hire somebody to, to make it manually. And that when we sign out any molecular pathology BRAF for any patient, um, we have a data sheet that we fill in and um, then that data is taken by the analyst uh, at the entry person and, and put into our database, which is where I get all the information from. So what was happening was that there's two types of surgical pathology dates that get um, recorded. One is when they sign out the diagnosis, but then when they get the BRAF result back, they put it into the surgical diagnostic report and then they sign it out again. And so that creates a revised date. And what was happening is that it was actually uh, like you can imagine that when we're trying to calculate dates from this database, that sometimes we were getting a negative number from the time that it was referred from the oncologist to when it was signed out. Uh, and we're like, well, that's weird. It should be opposite, but it's because the data analyst person was using the revised sign out date into, instead of the original surgical pathology date. And I'm so glad we caught it early. Um, and it was a reminder to the pathologist to just how to fill it out correctly here. So what I wanna say and what I wanna highlight from hearing all of your presentations and from what we've been doing in the lab for the last four years is that we didn't, no one ever asked for any big fancy equipment to make these healthcare transformations within the within the patient for the patients that we serve and a lot of this was process improvement that then translated into transformational change and this reminds me a lot of my role as a chair for the women leading philanthropy campaign at RUH foundation because that's a it's a hundred thousand dollar grant that's given to a female led project um, that will help transform healthcare for the patients at RUH and their families. And none of the last four projects that we have funded had anything to do with equipment or buying a um, something that that was like AI related. It was all due to this type of process improvement and this change in thinking and how can we deliver this care? Because those are where the good ideas come in. We, I think that the group here is quite savvy to think that there is going to be no machine that is going to solve the problems for us. And it was, it's these women led projects that have just been able to take what the snapshot of how they're delivering healthcare is and make that um, process change to be able to improve it. So I hear this a lot um, that we need time, that there is no time, that everybody is burnt out. There was a lot of talk about culture um, within your projects. Um, and 
I would just, I would put forward this analogy is that we are all on our bicycle and we are pedaling so fast on our bicycle, getting to where we need to go and we're good at it and we know exactly how to do it and we know where everything is, like where the potholes in the roads are. And we can, and we're, what we're saying is, I cannot pedal any faster. I am getting there as fast as I can go. You cannot possibly ask me to do anything else. And what I am asking is that we need to have time to get off of the bicycle and get into the car and use the GPS and then drive at a reasonable pace in the car. I do, we don't need to pedal any faster. That is not going to help anything. But going back to where I needed to get all of that out of my brain on a process map that is visual and have those aim statements and have a path forward to go and create that elevator speech and be able to know myself, who I am, how I communicate, and doing work on communication and just figuring out how other people would like to be communicated with, that all of that has allowed everything to slow down a bit. And for me to be able to relax a little bit when I'm carrying out these projects. And I will say that asking the deepers bench, which we do 47,000 surgical pathology cases a year, it translates to 98,000 blocks and 130,000 slides. Every patient that has a molecular test has to get, uh, the old process was that they have to get um, four scrolls of 10 microns. They have to go pick the block, they have to put it on the microtome, scroll it out. And uh, what we've asked them to do now is to take the block and punch it and put it in the Eckendorf tube. And they said, I can't, I can't possibly do anything else. I, you cannot ask me to do anything else. And we have to um, accept that and accept that resistance and hear them and listen to what they're saying to us. And we wanna offer them this solution. And once they learn how to punch the blocks, they're like, this is so much easier than the scrolls. Like, why weren't we doing this from the start? And this is where I think that the multitude of talent is going to come from here. And the biggest changes is that how are we getting off the bike and how are we getting in the car? And then commensurate to that is this concept of a butter butterfly walking. So like I've mentioned, part of my journey of learning who I was and what my values were and my communication style and why I really need to have those that are opposite to me and diverse to me on my teams is this concept that I came across about a butterfly walking. And it is that a butterfly is designed to um, soar and fly and to utilize the, all of the gifts that it's been given, which all of you, there is no question that you have many gifts to give. And sometimes we are our own worst enemy in that instead of choosing to fly, we are carrying those wings on our back and like struggling to walk across the pavement. And a lot of this you'll see probably within your projects is what are you doing to help self-sabotage your project? And I can tell you the limitations in my successful spread and I, I were my butterfly walking moments. And so I'll share with you what I was doing and, and this works better as an animation. However, I can share with you what the, um, the pathway was. So what ends up happening if things are non-conforming and things don't get reflexed and they go through this process and they get a referral to the pathologist. What was happening is that I thought that I was being a great division head and a great project manager is that every time those referrals came back from the oncologist, I said, I'll, I'll take them. I don't wanna bother. I'm not gonna bother the other pathologists. They're busy. 
I know that they meant to refer and reflexively order that. I'll I'll take it and I'll I'll pick the block and I'll make sure that do the checklist and make sure that all of that stuff. I did not involve my my army of pathologists here. I didn't involve them. I I was correcting their own um th their own non-standard events. And so how are they going to know that they're non-standard? Oh, okay, well every 4 months I feed back to them that they missed 20% of their cases. When, when really this is an, a chance for immediate feedback and to involve the team. And a lot of that happened because I am scared for making any of these changes because what if I make it worse? So I was trying to at least mitigate what I thought was uh, like making this different process. And then all of a sudden, and, and who knows what my definitions for worse are. Worse is that the that the 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 worst is that the patient misses out on the opportunity. But like, in sometimes in your mind, equally worse is that your uh, colleagues think that you're being overbearing or making them do something that they don't want to do. Or does this pay person not like me anymore? So all of the non-reflex cancer clinic requests I was ordering for my army of pathologists, and um, like I said. I was scared that this um, was causing, what if this was worse than what it was uh, was previous or what if it was causing more harm? And so uh, you can see that I build in a lot of like sequential approaches or stepwise approaches as well. That, and, and the stepwise approach is, um, and it, it highlights perfectly between the colorectal and the, the derm team because the derm team is autonomous they are engaged. We made the switch and I feel pretty good about it. And um, I will say that that was sequential. They did it back in December. The col colorectal team, we've had to have more meetings. We've had to hear more concerns. We've had to go at a slower pace. And I would say that that is yes, sequential, but also parallel because we're still doing, we're doing the blocks and we're doing the scrolls still. And that's okay. We did it with liquid-based cytology too. We implemented liquid-based cytology and when people weren't ready, we still accepted the conventional smears. For a year, we did that. Um, so yeah, I, I do think that it's important to have my pathologist army buy-in with the sequential and the parallel approach. And it, and it's funny, um, things that you don't realize is that the derm group, that like the, the, the colon group is now getting slightly jealous of the derm group a little bit, or like at least seeing something that they're doing that they're not doing. And I didn't think that that would be a motivator, but it's like fascinating that um, it's almost like the scarcity model of like not be, not having something that someone else has. So implementing uh, this system change and continuing to have it sustain itself over a number of years is that there is this feeling that it's never done. That I, I feel like I'm waiting for this sense of closure or a finale. And so that can be somewhat unsettling because it often, um, if I am reframing what my thoughts are, it's never like, look how far we've come. It's like, how is it not perfect yet? And how is it not done? So I would challenge everybody that when you're looking back at what your projects were and you're thinking to yourself, I didn't get it finished. I want that to be reframed and look at where I have come from now. And this is particularly difficult for physicians and uh, pharmacists that you have you are likely in this role because you have, like to have a sense of control and you like to achieve and this concept might be difficult for you um but it is the exact same you're taking the exact same thing you are taking a fact of where your project is right now and instead of looking at where it needs to be you are looking and and feeling that type of success of how far we've come. But it's all just thought work. So I want to leave you with the fact that this is your beginning. And while you're graduating from the course, but th this is where you're going to 
take these skills and I, I mean, I'm excited to see how you're going to apply them and where you're going to be in the four years since you graduate and you can see what cohort two has done in four years and that you will be the butterfly spreading its wings, soaring, making transformational changes within the control that you have, looking back and helping all the other people in the cohort after you in this diverse group of medical professionals that span all aspects of touching patients throughout Saskatchewan. So this is the beginning for you. And I'm so excited for you and thank you very much for letting me to be a part of your, um, your graduation. And I am just so pleased to have been able to work with you all and be part of this team. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mary. I, I want to believe I'm not the only one in thinking that you perhaps need to add another heart to your many hearts, which is motivational speaking, because I, I'm sure I'm not alone in feeling energized, feeling pumped by your story. And I think that particular analogy of the butterfly will stick with me for the rest of my life. It's such a, you know, it's giving me goosebumps. It's a, it's a very inspiring story. Thank you for sharing that with us today. I know we're just running very close to the end, but a few things I made notes for myself. I'm sure many people do that as well. One of the key learnings that I had in my QM clinical improvement core journey was that at the end of our program, I realized that when we started, I thought doing this QI program would involve a lot of scientific stuff. I had to like do a lot of analytics and mathematics and everything. But the very key things that, that I think made the most impact to me were the non-clinical stuff that we learned. Mary alluded to the find your why. I think all of us that day, I mean, the room was quiet. By the time we finished that session, there were a few tears because it takes you to a really, really deep, deeper place. And having the knowledge of, you know, self, um, they, they say that, you know, leaders, you have to start by learning yourself, discovery, learning, learning who you are. And other things about how to run a meeting, how to communicate, team selection, those really soft-ish, non-clinical stuff, non-technical stuff is really what is uh, the thing that I feel very important in making sure that your team, your project is really successful and from what we've heard from Mary today, you can see that it's not just so much about her or the technical knowledge that she has, but the team and the ability to make a cohesive team from everybody all around her. So thank you very much. That was a very, very wonderful keynote address. Thank you. Now we have a few minutes for questions and talk and you know general questions for all the participants. If anybody wants to open the floor for about two, three minutes before we go to the next session. You can type a question in the chat box and I'll read them out. Yeah, lots of accolade for Mary and really well deserved. Yeah, Matthew said I got goosebumps. So did I, yeah, that was, we need to clone her. We need to have more of Mary's in the province. <laughs> We need to clone her. Be more like Mary. Yes, oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I spend a lot of my time trying to, um, to not to be more like other people, but uh, j just recognizing, yes, what the strengths that I have, but um, I am very much incomplete if I don't have those other parts of my team. So I am a, I am a red, yellow, a very strong red, yellow in communicators. And it used to drive me insane, the blues and the greens, which the majority of pathologists are. And, but I have found that the embracement of the blues and the greens, they help me so much because big picture thinker, not a lot of details. I have I learned, um, I have learned OCD. There's two types of pathologists, those that have like personality OCD and those that have learned OCD. So you have to have learned OCD to be a good pathologist, but like, it's, it, it really just stops at the slides for me. So anything else that I do doesn't have, I don't have that. And I rely so heavily on the other pathologists and my dyad that 
do have a strength in that that they are able to it's it's like the harness harness and I might be dating myself but if you ever used to watch Saturday Night Live with Mike Myers and he would play that little kid with the harness and he was like constantly jumping he's like look at me look at me like that's me and I rely on my dyad Rhonda who's very blue to like just kind of hold me back a little bit and be like we have to do things within the SHA system and these are the steps that we need to follow and it's been like I would not be successful without that balance. Thank you. Does anybody have any comment or question generally for everybody? And for Just me, say, Mary, Mary, that as a surgeon, we, we are frequently say that, uh, that, that whoever could put gallbladders in patients to keep surgeons humble. And, uh, and I, I think that, <laughs> that there's a certain amount of humility we need to do to do QI and uh, you just helped us to. Keep that humility. I think uh, it, it. What always seems like something that so, should be so easy is, in fact, so difficult and takes time, and patience and a little humility. Thanks. Thanks very much, Gary. Anybody else? It was very interesting to see for me that across the, uh, the quick talks this morning, there were four uh, at least four projects that I could pinpoint. They were related to transition of care, which is something that I, you know, if you were doing a run chart, you could almost say that's the beginning of a trend. So perhaps that's something that, you know, system leaders should pay a little more attention to because it seems that all of a sudden our clinicians are interested in that transition of care, handover notes, you know, prescription reconciliation and things like that. And that's very, not too surprising, but that's a very eye opening thing for me that I noticed. This morning, just a pattern that I noticed. Anyway, of course, everybody had. It's something we know already, but it's nice to see that at this point, everybody like change is difficult, change is slow. We know that, but you know, but when you've been on that receiving end to see how frustrating sometimes it can be to implement just one single thing, you know, you have a better appreciation of the healthcare system in general. And thank you all once again for your patience, for your hard work. At this point in the ceremony, normally we would like throw up your heart and get your certificates and your SOX presentation. Unfortunately, we can't do that virtually. And we all normally would present to you your certificate nicely framed in a plaque and have a ceremony, walk up the stage, shake the hand of the guest speaker. But of course, you can't do that. You can virtually shake Gary's hand though if you want to. <laughs> Just give him a virtual handshake. And then um, everybody will be presented with the um, illustrious QI. I love QI socks. I still have mine um, in my in my drawer somewhere. And I remember we went somewhere on holiday, and somehow on the plane I managed to get my socks, my QI socks torn. And I'm like, no, I'm never giving it away. I'm just gonna patch it up with my sewing machine. Or this is not part of my wardrobe, and it remains there forever. So everybody will be presented with the socks. You get your framed. Um, certificate in the mail and sought at some point just for us QI team, QC uh, team to say thank you for your patience for staying with us and for participating in the program. And as mentioned earlier, the cohort six is coming up soon, so we lean on you all as well soon to be previous participants to tap on shoulders of your colleagues, those who think you might be interested. And one thing that we've noticed over the years is that if you think your project needs to continue and you have somebody within your team that you perhaps feel can continue with what you're doing, who may benefit from attending the program, the physicians have been known to tap shoulders of their colleagues to apply for the program as well. So the applications will open on the 17th of June. The program itself starts early 2023. So we rely on you to spread the word and also to be part of the CQ alumni community. The program thrives on previous participants coming back home, if I could use that term, to give back to the community, either by signing up to be coaches, faculty members, or just generally participating in whatever way you can. The Health Quality Council team will be sending out emails maybe in the fall to see, engage everyone's interest and who might be interested in becoming coaches or faculty or otherwise. One thing I have learned over the past few years of being involved as a faculty and as a coach is that 
for every code we have, I learn more and more and more. There's no Brandon sessions are never the same. Even though I've listened to them over the time, you still end up learning new things every time, you know. And we've had the privilege of sitting in the presence of many guest speakers who have been very um, world-renowned speakers. So it's a good place to give back to the community. And that will be it from us. Have I missed anything, Jen? Don't forget to do the feedback for us. The link is in the chat. Um, link feedback for this meeting and also for the overall reflection of the program in itself. And on behalf of my colleagues, faculty team members, CQ team, HQC team, from all of us, want to say thank you very much for for listening to our voices over the past few months and for being for trusting us to be part of your learning journey. Thank you once again, everybody, and congratulations on your success. And that's it from me. Jen, any final word? Not at all. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Um, our the CQIP talks and whatnot will be posted on our website in the in the near future. Um, so we thank you for attending and please provide feedback. In the spirit of continuous improvement, we're always looking to improve these events. And uh, yeah, we look forward to reconnecting at another time. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of your day, and also have a good weekend. Bye. Hi. Thanks, everyone, Bye. and congratulations.